Hello dear friends, welcome to Life After Life Spirit Reports based on the beautiful book Heaven and Hell by Alan Kardec. We meet every Sunday night at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We are in California, so it is 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time to discuss the second half of this of the of Heaven and Hell, which contains the life reports of life after life. And in the last few weeks, we have been focusing on the happy spirits. But I would like to take a minute to recap the last month or so that we have been meeting. Just so for those of you who come in today, tonight for the first time, that you know a little bit about where we are. So I'm just going to spend a minute on that. What we learned in the past few weeks is that our transition, of course, mandatory because we all have to experience them, it um, is dependent on what kind of life we're living. So in other words, we learned that it is primarily the soul that feels pain and can feel pain during our transition, during our so-called physical death where our physical form falls off. And this pain that we may experience is our connection of the peri spirit to our physical body. And if that connection is really strong at the moment of our transition, then we will experience more suffering, more pain. And then secondly, there is a phenomenon that happens sometimes slightly before death, during the excarnation and primarily after excarnation and that is called the state of confusion and that is based on the report from the spirits also a very painful state for the soul now we're asking ourselves what can we do to shorten our state of confusion and also to lighten or let's say loosen our connection to our physical body, the connection of the soul and perispirit from our physical body. What can we do today in order to prepare ourselves, hopefully for an easy transition? That is really what we're concerning ourselves with. And the answer is, I'm sure those of you who have been here before remember, the answer is we can prepare ourselves through our inner transformation through our moral transformation. So the more we do the good, the more we understand the teachings that we here at Kardec Radio bring to you, what Alan Kardec in his um, codification brought to us, what ultimately Jesus brought to this planet. If we understand it, study it, and practice it increasingly more, hopefully every second of each single day, we, we are on the right track to helping ourselves for our preparing and helping ourselves for our transition. So then in the last uh, few weeks, we focused, as I said, on the happy spirits. And um, we will be transitioning to a different category soon, but we're still with the happy spirits. And we're learning. We're learning every single week of what they've done in their lives that helped them to end up being happy spirits on the other side. And so some of the things that they taught us, and we're just doing a brief summary, is love our enemies. They also taught us to be courageous in the face of adversity, to never give up. They also taught us resignation, resignation as the surrender of our hearts to the vicissitudes of our lives. And they also taught us very strongly and repeatedly to forgive, always to forgive, and then to be charitable and to particularly practice charity that is called benevolence, goodwill, goodwill towards all. And then one of the spirits was very regretful that he didn't know what he knew after his transition. So education, he stressed. He kept saying, educate yourselves to prepare yourselves. And then we learned that blessed are we when we are afflicted. So during our lifetimes, when we suffer, 
that is actually a blessing, a blessing that God allows us to un for us to undo some of our past wrongs. And then we learned that we always need to practice the good, of course, and that we need to use our time wisely. We looked at a chapter in um, Jesus in Our Home, which is titled The Forgotten Gift. And we were reminded that we were giving a gift by God, all of us, and that is called time, and we need to use it wisely and always for the good. And then we were told to be humble, to always pray, to feel less separated from our loved ones and anyone once we have transitioned. We were also told that transitioning when we are young is actually a blessing because it tells us that God allows us to transition to go back home, that we have fulfilled our duties for this particular lifetime. And last week, we also learned from, from a countess who had, was very wealthy and had it all, so to speak, from our earthly perspective, from our earthly material perspective. And she said, be frugal. She actually saved a lot of her resources that she had, and instead of spending them on herself, she spent them on the poor. What a beautiful thing, friends. Something that we wanted to take into this week as a sort of homework to see how far we can get with that goal of spending less on ourselves and using the resources instead on the poor, on those who have less than we do. And then lastly, we also learned that actually being wealthy of material means is the more difficult life. It is the more challenging life because we have more opportunity to be selfish and consequently cause more evil for ourselves and for others. So before we continue with our new case today, I want to say hi to our community, to our friends who joined us, and here's Chris, Chris Ferreira. So nice to see you, Chris. Thank you so much for joining us. Chris is one of our members at Divine Light Spiritus Center here in Nevada City in Northern California, which we founded a year and a half ago. Thank you, Chris, and there is Saul. Thank you so much for joining, and um, yes, hello, Saul, as well. Tony Gar Garcia, Garnica, Tor Torres, sorry, I know you as Tony Torres. Torres is, uh, Tony is also a member of our um, spiritual group, our study group. Thank you so much for joining, Tony, nice to see you. And there's Nora Brazil, hello, friend, thanks for joining. And Teresa Castro, always happy to have you. So nice to be together. So friends, let's see what we can learn today. Every week is full of lessons because these wonderful, happy spirits have so much to teach us and we have so much to learn. So today's case is Antoine Cousteau and you will find him on page 301 in part two of Heaven and Hell. Mr. Cousteau, who was actually a friend of Mr. Sanson. Uh, for those of you who were here a few weeks ago, this was our first spirit report. Mr. Sanson, like Mr. Cousteau, were members of the Parisian Spiritist Society. And they spent time together before their past and now in the spirit world. So Mr. Cousteau was a member of the Parisian Spiritist Society and was buried on September 12, 1863 in a common grave in the Montmartre Cemetery, which is in Paris. He was a man of heart whom Spiritism had led back to God. His faith in God was complete, sincere and profound. He was a simple street repairer and practiced charity in thought, word, and deed, in keeping with the frail resources at his disposal. For in spite of such restrictive means, he found ways to help those who had less than he did. So let we see that Mr. Cousteau was a nobleman. 
He was a nobleman, not because he had a lot of money in that lifetime. He was actually a simple, so-called simple street repairer. But what he did is he was charitable and used his resources to help those who were in need. So friends, another example of someone who is not emphasizing, putting the emphasis on himself, but on those who are in need. And consequently, he ended up being a happy spirit. But there's more to his story. So if the society did not acquire a private tomb for him, it was because it seemed more important to Mr. Cousteau that such money for a private tomb for him be put to better use in benefit of the living <clears throat> than in the vain satisfaction of self-centeredness. <clears throat> Excuse me, friends. So Mr. Cousteau wanted to use the money not on his burial, on his tomb, but on those who were still alive and needed the money. Again, let's make a mental note, something to keep in mind, maybe something we want to incorporate into our own lives. Right, friends? There's always something new to learn to be charitable. Then he said, besides we spared his snow better than anyone else, that a common grave is a doorway to heaven as much as any expensive mausoleum. So it doesn't matter whether we have a huge grave, whether we have to have a big tombstone, where we are buried, if it's just the ashes that are spread, it's either way the gateway to heaven. And the heaven, that the so-called heaven that we may experience, depends on our lives we're living today. Because it is today that we work on our future. So then Mr. Cousteau was um, invoked. Um, no, he, yeah, he was invoked at his burial. And it was right when his, when his grave was still open that one of the society's mediums, so one of the Parisian so Spiritist Society's mediums, obtained the following communication right there at the still open grave. So everybody was very impressed and touched by what transpired right here at the open grave of Mr. Cousteau. And here's what Mr. Cousteau tells us. And how consoling it is to be able to say, oh, I have not died. I am now living the true life, the eternal life. Let us pause, dear friends. So Mr. Cousteau tells us that he has now arrived at true life, the eternal life, and that is after his excarnation. So let us see how we can learn, what we can learn about the eternal life. And at, at first we're going to go to the Spirit's book, page, uh, question 153. Let us see. It is question 153 which we find in the chapter, The Return from the Corporeal to the Spirit Life. And Alan Kardec very wisely asked the following question. In what sense should we understand the eternal life? And the answer from the illuminated spirits was, only the life of the spirit is eternal. The life of the body is transitory and temporary. When the body dies, the soul returns to the eternal life. So this gives us a little bit of a clue that the eternal life actually refers to the life of our spirit because our spirit is immortal. It is our spirit that has eternal life and it's our body that falls off. And of course, we know that. No, but it is good to hear again, isn't it, friends? Now let us go to the gospel and let us educate ourselves a little bit more. Let's see, we go to page 59 in the Gospel. It's pretty much at the beginning, page 59. And Jesus taught us, my kingdom is not of this world, which is related to the eternal life, to the real life. And there is first chapter, the future life. And here, Alan Kardec tells us, with these words, namely, my kingdom is not of this world, Jesus clearly refers to the future life, which he presents in every circumstance, 
as the end where humankind will end up and as the object of people's principal concerns while on earth. All of his maxims referred to this great principle. So friends, let's, let, let's recognize that. So the eternal life, the spirit, the, the future life, the kingdom, as um, Jesus mentioned, is actually extremely important. It is at the core of Jesus' teachings and whatever he presented, he always alluded to the kingdom is not of this world, that our future, that our kingdom, our success lies in our future life. And again, we can prepare ourselves today. So let's see, he continues to say, this doctrine therefore can be considered as the focal point of Christ's teachings and it is placed towards the beginning of this book because it must be the goal of all persons. So the goal for us is our future life. Now there's a lot of people who say, well, all we have is the present, the present moment. And on some level that is true because that's what we have right now. And that is this now that we have right now is how we prepare ourselves for the future life. Those, this is the seed packet we are carrying or we are acquiring right at this very moment because it is the seeds that we put into our garden of eternity today that determine the kingdom of heaven that is not of this world that Jesus promised to us. So then, let's see, then he, he continues on to say that the Jews of their times observed God's laws with reward of earthly possessions. So according to Alan Kardec, the Jews back then focused on their religious practices, looking at, an, at a reward coming from the material world. And so Moses could not have said more than he did to an uneducated people. So that was the stance, the opinion, the knowledge of, as he says, quote unquote, uneducated people at the time. But then later Jesus came. And he revealed to them that there is another world. There is another world past the material world where God's justice follows its course. It is this world that Jesus promises to those who observe God's laws and where the good ones will find their recompense. That world is his kingdom. So friends, if we learn about God's laws, which we find, by the way, in the third part of the Spirit's book, all God's laws are explained in the most amazing, beautiful, complete way. And if you don't feel like picking up the Spirit's book and reading it yourselves, you could go to Kardec Radio and you'll find in the archives and also on the um, Kardec Radio Facebook page a beautiful account of the... of. Um, God's Laws, presented by Carol Cohere. Every Saturday afternoon, she does a few questions, and she's, I think, at the second or third law. It is wonderful and so easy to understand, and she explains it in a way that it really touches our hearts. And when things touch our hearts, we know we are transformed. So we need to follow God's laws, and as we follow God's laws, we work on our inner transformation, which will help us to create a better future life. And that is the teaching that Jesus gave us, emphasizing that we need to pay attention to that today. And lastly, he says, with spiritism, the future life is no longer a simple article of faith or hypothesis. It is a material reality demonstrated by the fact Eyewitnesses have come to describe this reality in all its faces. Friends, that is exactly heaven and hell. This is what we are doing. We are talking, we are reading, we are studying, we are feeling and experiencing and practicing what the eyewitnesses from the other side tell us what worked for them. And what worked for them works for everyone because that means they followed God's law and they are eternal. So friends... It is pretty clear, right? We need to follow God's laws. So then we go to um, page 65. And um, 
We have a queen of France who channels some information on this, and she says on the kingdom of heaven, and she adds to it. She says, in order to prepare oneself for a place in this kingdom, the kingdom that, that Jesus promises to us, self-denial, humility, charity, in all its heavenly forms, and benevolence towards all are required. Here we go again, right? All the spirits teach us the same thing. Self-denial, humility, charity, benevolence. You are not asked who you were or what position you occupied, but what good you did, the tears you wiped away. This is what the one queen told us, queen of France. Have pity on those who have not gained, gained the kingdom of heaven. Help them with your prayers, for prayer brings people closer to the Most High. It is the link of union between heaven and earth. So she even teaches us that we can do something for those who are not aware of the kingdom of heaven yet, that are not aware that we need to prepare ourselves for our future lives, for our eternal life today. And that is prayer. We can always pray. And that is also a form of charity. So let us go back to Mr. Cousteau. Let us see where we are here. Um, the book kind of moved on me. All right, so we learned that um, the eternal life is at the core of Jesus' teachings. And since it is at the core of Jesus' teachings, we know it is at our core for, our, for us as well. So let us see, Teresa is saying, um, first of all, there's Adriana Martinez. Hello, nice, thank you for joining. And Teresa Castro is saying the program with Carol is Saturdays at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It's 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And it is the um, so-called Gospel at Home meeting. I think that's how she calls it. But what she goes over is God's laws. It's the third part of the Spirit's book. Carol, you're watching, so if you want to if you want to say something about your program, feel free to do it. It is wonderful and so educational. Thank you. So let us go back to Mr. Um, to Monsieur rather Cousteau. So um, then he continues to say. So we are at his grave. Let us remember he's we are at his grave, and he's being invoked by one of the mediums. The burial of the poor doesn't involve large processions, Mr. Cousteau. Monsieur Cousteau tells us nor are pompous ceremonials performed at their graveside. And yet, my friends, believe me, there is no lack of an immense crowd here. So Mr. Cousteau is surrounded by good spirits, he tells us, by a multitude of good spirits, and it doesn't matter how his um, burial was, pompous or not. So we need to remember that no big tombstone, none of that matters. What matters is how we conducted ourselves during our lifetime. So then he addresses his dear wife. He also addresses his relatives and fellow spiritists. And then he says goodbye to you all. So we're not going into all what he says there, but we're staying, um, going to his next um, invocation, which happened three days later. And if you want to follow along, we're now on page 304. Yes, Carol, it is the third part of the Spirit's book. Yes, those are God's laws. Very, very important. So three days later, Monsieur Cousteau's spirit was evoked in a private group. Now he's buried and he says, first thing he says, friends, death is life exclamation mark death is life oh my friends what a beautiful spectacle it is to see the banners of spiritism waving upon the earth spiritism is a profound immense science about which you have only spoken the first few words and let us remember this happened in the latter part of the 19th century. So spiritism was just in the process of being codified by Alan Kardec. 
So that is why he says, Spiritism has only spoken the first few words. But don't we sometimes feel it's still like that here in the United States and the rest of the world, the world outside of Brazil, that it feels like we're only starting, right? So these words still ring true and um, taken to be taken to the, to our hearts. And what light it brings to men of goodwill, so spiritism, and what light it brings to men of goodwill. So let us pause, dear friends, spiritism. Let's look a little bit more. That's something that we usually don't do. We don't look at spiritism, how, how we can learn a little bit more about what spiritism actually is. So we're looking for the right page. And um, we're going to, again to the gospel. And we're going to chapter 1, right at the beginning, page 50. Page 50 in the Gospel, chapter 1. And it is, chapter 1 is actually the three revelations. Now, the three revelations are, number 1, Moses. Number 2, Jesus. And number 3, Spiritism. And that is why we go there. So, Monsieur Cousteau is really hailing Spiritism, and it had just started. And let us see what we're reading, what we're learning here. Spiritism is the new science that has come to reveal to humans by means of irrefutable proofs the existence and nature of the spirit world and its re relations with the corporeal world. It shows us that the world no longer shows us the world no longer is something supernatural, but instead as one of the living and incessantly active forces of nature, as the source of a multitude of phenomena hitherto incomprehensible, and for that reason relegated to the domain of the fantastic and extraordinary. So spiritism is the new science. It actually brings proof, proof to phenomena that were before spiritism came along called miracles or fell into the domain of the supernatural. Because people call things miracles or supernatural and we may be guilty of that too if our minds can't make meaning of it. When we don't understand, we think it's, it's something supernatural. And here comes spiritism explaining, explaining a lot of those phenomena and taking the myth out of it. And it does that with the help of spirits on high who actually explain to us of how it actually all works. Where do we come from as spirits? Why we're here and where we're going? And with the first book, the spirits book with 1019 questions, which, is, which helps us to demystify the so-called miracles that up until that day where spiritism was codified existed. And this is what they're telling us here. And then they continue on to say, it is, it is to such relations that Christ alludes on several occasions and that it is why many things that he said have remained unintelligible or wrongly interpreted. Spiritism is the key that enables everything to be easily explained. And when we look at the gospel according to spiritism, all the allegories that, that Jesus brought to us, that so many of us had a hard time really understanding and knowing what did actually Jesus mean by that, are now very clear with the help of Alan Kardec and the spirits on high who help us understand so that we can actually feel the lessons and bring them home into our own daily practice. Then, he's, then we learn the law of the Old Testament is personified in Moses. That of the New Testament is personified in Christ. Spiritism is the third revelation of God's law, but it is not personified in any particular individual. Rather, it is the product of a teaching given, most, given not by one person, but by the spirits. Who are the voices of heaven at all points of the earth and thought and through a countless multitude of intermediaries? So here, spiritism helps us to understand. Spiritism is not one person anymore. 
The first revelation, Moses was personified. The second revelation, Jesus was a person. And then spiritism came, which brings us the multitude, the voices of the multitude of spirits on high, explaining to us the universe, explaining to us of how things are connected. Then when we go to page um, 128, let us move on to chapter 6 in the Gospel because that helps us to understand how Spiritism was actually already promised by Jesus. Chapter 6, page 128, it's called The Promised Consoler. And it is in John that we read that Jesus said, If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray to my Father, and he will send you another Consoler so that he may remain with you forever, the spirit of truth. The spirit of truth is the promised consoler, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. So then later on, the spirit of truth in the gospel actually gives us messages. And the spirit of truth also covers all the high spirits that gave us the information. Then, after the, the quote from John, Alan Kardec in the, in the Gospel tells us, Jesus promises another consoler, the spirit of truth, whom the world does not yet know because it is not mature enough to understand him, and whom the Father will send to teach all things and bring to remembrance what Christ has said. So at the time, that the people, the people, when the people during Jesus' time were alive, they would have not been able to comprehend what we are now capable of hopefully comprehending. And that is why Spiritism came at the perfect time when we had developed, when our consciousness had developed far enough that we were actually now ready to hear more through the Spirit of Truth, through Spiritism. If the Spirit comes to bring you remembrance what Christ has said, it is because it has been forgotten or poorly understood. And we can attest to that, right friends? It is easily forgotten Jesus' teachings and they're easily misunderstood. Churches have claimed to have the truth and often misinterpreted what Jesus said more for selfish reasons than actually for the common good. Then. He says, Spiritism has come at the stated time to fulfill Christ's promise. The spirit of truth presides over its establishment. It calls humans to observe the law, God's laws, and teaches all things by enabling them to understand what Christ said only in parables. So friends, it is clear Spiritism has a humongous and amazing purpose for us to explain further Jesus' teachings and to help us remember them. And it is through the Spirit of Truth that Jesus already promised as the promised consoler during his days that we understand today all the phenomena, not only today's phenomena, all the phenomena that were up until then called mysteries supernatural phenomena, and so forth. And it is spiritism that was just in its infant shoes at the time that Monsieur Cousteau had passed. And that is why he is saying that spiritism is a profound, immense science. And he is saying that it just started to wave its flag on the earth. And we're grateful to this day that spiritism exists and we're grateful to all those who spread it in the English language and grateful to Kardec Radio above and beyond everything else because it wasn't, if it wasn't for Kardec Radio, we English speakers would be at a loss. We would just have a few books which are wonderful, but this brings them home and brings them alive and helps us to take those lessons to heart and practice them. So then Monsieur Cousteau says, and what light Spiritism brings to men of good world, those who, having broken the terrible chains of pride, loudly proclaim their belief in God. Pride, dear friends. Let us pause again. Pride. We have to stop at pride. 
and understand pride in its bigger picture because it is one of those lessons that we need to take to heart. So let us see, if we find the right note, then we are actually ready. So here we go. I looked up selfishness and pride on Google because I wanted to have um, a little bit of a different uh, perspective to maybe bring in and learned that the perspective isn't different, but I will read it to you anyway. So what I found is selfishness and pride always go together. A truly humble person cannot be selfish. A truly humble person cannot be, be selfish. Those are two things, humble and selfish, that exclude each other. Pride is self-importance and self-focus, which leads to selfishness, which is selfish thinking and selfish acting. So pride is self-importance. I'm more important than you are. I'm better than you are. I am this more, I'm that more than you are. So that is self-importance, which leads, obviously, to my focus on my on the focus on myself and leads to selfishness. And selfishness is rooted in selfish thinking and selfish acting. Pride produces selfishness. Pride produces selfishness. All selfishness is a manifestation of pride. So the underlying root cause to selfishness is pride. I'm better, I'm more important. It is hidden. Pride is hidden, but manifests in selfish through selfish acts. So I thought that was very interesting and true. I kind of observed it. It is really true that <clears throat> selfishness is louder than pride, and yet it is pride that feeds selfishness that's really at the root cause of selfishness. But they work together and they feed each other <clears throat> and they always appear together. So when we go to the Spirit's Book, question 913, Spirit's Book, our trusty Spirit's Book always helps us so tremendously. So question 913, staying with the theme, we find a whole chapter on selfishness, friends. First question in the chapter called Selfishness, which is under moral perfection. Of all the vices, which may we regard as the root? Alan Kardec asks the spirits on high, on high. And what are they saying? I'm sure you can guess the answer. They're saying, we have already told you many times, selfishness. All evil derives from selfishness. So friends, that's it. It's simple. It's absolutely simple and yet super complicated. Because it's one of those vices that we all carry. I want to be so bold as to say we're all prideful and selfish to a certain degree, to varying degrees. And it is the one vice that's the worst and prevents us from being charitable, of course, because it's self-centered. Now, when we go to the Gospel, chapter 11, chapter 11, which is Loving One's Neighbor, page 193, we learn a little bit more. And of course, this subject is woven through the literature, through the Spiritist literature, pride and selfishness, because it's one of those core vices or the core vice. And there we find another chapter on selfishness. And I invite you to look it up more in depth, because of course, the chapters are there. We're just picking the tip of an iceberg. We're not going any deeper but I'm we're picking these out just to give you a little bit of a teaser and hopefully you will feel interested enough to pick up the books and read the rest of the chapters because there's so much more than what we're mentioning so selfishness um, page 193 in the gospel according to spiritism chapter 11 loving one's neighbor as oneself and of course before we even read it's clear we can't love our neighbor as ourselves if we are prideful and selfish, right? So here we're reading. Let me see. It is by our beloved teacher, Emmanuel. Emmanuel, always so clear and such a great educator, tells us, Selfishness, that plague of humankind, must disappear from the earth, whose small progress it hinders. He says it all in one sentence, right? He just says it's the plague 
in humanity and it is must disappear it must disappear from the earth he's very clear very strong and because it hinders our moral progress it hinders us from our inner transformation and it is the inner transformation that we need for everything we need for our future life we need to for our, for an easy transition it we need it for our own current happiness right friends it our inner transformation our moral progress is the core reason of why we are here and going from lifetime to lifetime. Then he says, selfishness is the target at which all true believers must aim their weapons. <laughs> Emmanuel is always so clear. Their strength, so must aim their weapons, their strength and their courage. So he says, selfishness is the target at which all true believers must aim their weapons, their strength and their courage courage. I say their courage because more courage is needed to overcome oneself than to overcome other people. Wow, friends, this is an important lesson, right? So when we hear like Paul of Tarsus and Abigail and Paul of Tarsus always teaching us about courage, the happy spirit, several of them said, have courage. It's always the courage, the biggest courage we need is to overcome ourselves. Emmanuel is very clear. So let all of you therefore make every effort to fight selfishness within you for that monster that devours all minds. That child of pride is the source of all the miseries of this world. Do we have to say more? It is the negation of charity and consequently the greatest obstacle to human happiness. Uproot selfishness, he says, from the earth so that earth can ascend the scale of worlds. For the time has come for humankind to don the toga of manhood. And to do so, you must first uproot selfishness from your hearts. By donning the toga of manhood, what is meant, it's, it's a picture from the Roman days when the white toga symbolized manhood and um, the boys of ancient Rome, it's a footnote, were allowed to use the white toga symbolizing manhood. So once you could wear the white toga, you were an adult in ancient Rome. And so when he says uproot selfishness from the earth so that earth can ascend the scale of worlds, for the time has come for humankind to become mature, to be mature, to grow up. And to do so, you must first uproot selfishness from your hearts. So friends, he's telling us we can't be mature pe um, people, being spirits, if we do not work on our selfishness and pride. Emmanuel is pretty dramatic about this, very clear and very strong in his expressions of for us to remind us, for us to understand that in our transformation, the core of the work is to work on our letting go of our pride and selfishness. So next thing is, um, there is more about it since it's such an important subject. Leon Denis. Friends, you probably know him. We have a wonderful study group every Tuesday night, 6.30 Eastern Standard Time, uh, 9.30 Eastern Standard Time on Cardiac Radio, but it's a different book. That book is Spiritism in the Art, but right now we're going to Leon Denis After Death for just a minute, because here too, we find two chapters, one on pride, wealth, and poverty, and the next one on selfishness. And let us see what angle Leon Denis gives us on pride. Of all vices, pride is the most dangerous. And of course, they're both, Emmanuel says selfishness, but we know it's really unity. It's a unit. I mean, pride and selfishness go together. One can't ex um, uh, exist without the other. So Leon Denis says, of all vices, pride is the most dangerous and pride feeds selfishness. Pride is the greatest plague of humanity. From it all, this, it's from, from it all the slashes of social life, all clashes of class and rank, all intrigue, war and hatred proceed. It has covered the earth with blood and ruin. 
So he, he's telling us, are we confirming that all the wars, all the discord on earth, all based on selfishness and pride, on my country is better than yours, my religion is better than yours, I am more important than you are, that kind of thinking leads us into ruin. Then he says, it has covered the earth. Pride is still the originator of our sufferings in the life beyond the grave. And see, it even continues. He tells us it doesn't stop at our graves. Selfishness and pride, we take with us. We take with us in our mental body, in our peri spirit. And we're suffering continuously, even after this lifetime, if we don't address it, if we don't work on it today. So then he says, for, for the consequences of pride, reach beyond death and attain even to our far destiny, so even into future lives. Not only does pride withhold us from the affection of, for our neighbors, remember we just finished the chapter on loving your neighbor as yourself, and um, Emmanuel's chapter on selfishness is in there saying, we can't love our neighbors as ourselves if we're selfish. Here Leon Denis echoes it and he says, pride withholds us from the affection of our for, for our neighbors but it renders also improvement impossible by misleading us to our value and blinding us as to our defects friends when we're prideful we can't see that we're doing wrong we can't admit to it even if we could see it we wouldn't want to admit to it because that would be that would destroy our pride that would wiggle on our pride it is only by a rigorous examination of our thoughts and actions that we can hope to reform how can the proud person submit to such an analysis how can a pride proud person do the nightly review that um um who was it now i can't think um we read it in the gospel recommended to us to do every night Friends, please help to chime in. I, I have a blank moment. I can't remember who um, recommended the nightly review right now. But how can we do that? We can't see if we're prideful and selfish. We can't see ourselves. We can't admit that we've ever done anything wrong. Right, friends? So let us look at the remedy. How can we work on that? Let us go to the Spirits book, question 632, where Alan Kardec asks the Spirits on high, how can human beings, St. Augustine, thank you, thank you, Teresa, St. Augustine asked us to do or recommended for us to do what he did during his lifetime to work on himself. And that is the nightly review to go over the day, the previous day, to see where we can improve our or must improve ourselves. So how can a prideful person do that, right? Good question. So Alan Kardec had the same question and he said, so how can we assess ourselves when we as humans are so prone to error we can't really discern good from evil often right and that's based because of our pride and the good spirits answered very magically and here is our recipe for success as well the golden rule follow the golden rule do unto others as you would like them to do unto you and you can never go wrong that was their simple, straightforward, easy answer, difficult to, to practice, but I invite us all for the week to come to do a renewed effort of practicing, remembering, applying the golden rule so we can make a new consorted effort to letting go a little bit more of our pride and selfishness. So let us see. Um, then we, we move on. It's a beautiful chapter on, on, on pride, wealth, and poverty in Leon Denis after death. But we're going to move on to the next chapter, which is selfishness. And we're just going to pick a few little things out to um, see what he says about selfishness now. Selfishness is the brother of pride. And we learned earlier, it is really behind selfishness is pride. Pride is feeding selfishness. So selfishness is the brother of pride, he says, and proceeds from the same causes. It is amongst the soul's greatest ailments, and there is no greater obstacle to social improvement. He says that too, see? It's, it, all the spirits echo the same information, but I believe we can never hear it enough, right, friends? 
Selfishness is a remnant of the inferior state through which we have passed. It is a survival of the wild individualism that characterizes the brute. But the human being is preeminently a sociable being. He is destined to live with his fellows and can do nothing without them. So here we learn from Leon Denis a little an additional facet to selfishness. It is something that we carry from the past. When we were in the ancient days, maybe even before we were incarnated on planet Earth and we were brutes, we went through a phase which was what she calls the wild individualism, where we all, the survival of the fittest, it was me against the world. And we have actually developed past that. And as Spiritism and the Good Spirits through the Good Spirits teach us in one of the divine laws, the law of society, it is we're actually made to live in society because we are here to serve and learn and that we can most effectively do only in communion, in cohabitating, in living in society with other people and not in solitude, just taking care of myself. As a matter of fact, the spirits call the chosen life of solitude a selfish life because these people are actually not serving um, society. They're not living in society. But so friends, let us remember, so when we realize we're prideful and selfish, let us just, we know we have a more highly developed prefrontal cortex. We have buttons here. We can say stop. We don't need to run on those old programming. We can do it differently today. We can practice the golden rule to help us discern and we can remind ourselves to do good always. So let's see, is there more? Yeah, there is a lot more. However, we won't, we won't go deeper into this chapter. Again, very good read, very educational. He brings even more ideas than we just covered right now. And then lastly, I want to go to Thought in Life by Emmanuel, uh, chapter 24. Believe it or not, he too has a chapter, but he now talks about the flip side, which is humility. Humility, and he says, humility, which we know is the opposite. We can't be humble if we're prideful. Humility is magnificently manifested in all of the kingdoms of nature, he says. The sun, despite its greatness, touches the muddy swamp every day without complaining. Isn't that the truth? The sun, most one of the most powerful things in this planet, in this uh, universe, is extremely humble, never complaining, always continuing to shine. The flower silently perfumes the air, no complaints. Doesn't say one day, oh, I don't feel like it. I'm gonna keep the perfume to myself, right? Then he says, water is filtered to attain greater purity. And he continues, whenever there is lack of humility, that is essentially the acknowledgement of our smallness before the universe, the result is a blockage of our feelings, leading to manifestations such as pride, selfishness, and vanity that are responsible for discord in all sorts of delinquencies. So again, this is really key, friends. Let us let that sink in. Whenever there is lack of humility, and we just learned that in nature, nature is filled with humility. But when there is a lack, which we probably all have a lack of humility on some level, that is essentially the acknowledgement of our smallness, smallness before the universe. Because if we really tune in and we really see how small we really are when we look at the immensity of the universe, which really helps us to understand when we read Genesis. We have a study group at BSH uh, in Sacramento currently. We understand better how small we really are when we read 
um, Gen the book Genesis, which is one of uh, Alan Kardec's books. So um, whenever there is lack of humility, the result is a blockage of one's feelings. So when we lack humility, our hearts get closed because all we see is ourselves. Me, 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 and one more time, me, me first and me only. And then our hearts are closed. We can't see and we can't look beyond our nose, as we say, right? So then the blockage of our feelings. And when our feelings are blocked, that leads us to pride, selfishness, and vanity, he says. And that they are responsible for discord and all sorts of delinquency. And earlier we learned that selfishness and pride are the root cause for wars for all the conflicts we experience, which we, in politics, international politics, everywhere in the world. So then he says, um, you, um, he says, humility is not subservience. So we must not confuse that. He says, to cultivate, it is, primarily independence and inner freedom springing from the depths of our spirit. And then he says to cultivate humility. It is to advance without attachment, to project the best of ourselves towards others, to forget all evil, meaning ignorance, and joyfully begin once more the task to love. In order to reflect humility from heaven to earth for redemption and beauty, the Christ of God was born in a manger covered with straw and bid farewell to men on the outstretched arms of a cross. So he closes that chapter, and it's a beautiful chapter. I warmly recommend you to read it. He closes this chapter by giving us the example, the ultimate example of humility. The governor of our planet, Jesus Christ, was born in poverty in a manger on straw in a stable and he died humbly on the cross for having brought love to this planet he was crucified and he did not fight back so friends and he ended up just giving us lessons to the very last moment the lesson of forgiveness the lesson of the universal loving the universal family through the example of john and mother mary um Jesus Christ is the example par excellence of humility. So by understanding his teachings, we understand how to become more humble ourselves, friends. So after this detour, major detour, we'll go back to Monsieur Cousteau. Then he says, Oh, my brothers, think about the immense joy to have been the first initiates in the work of regeneration. Again, he is referring to spiritism. Honor is yours, my friends. Carry on and someday, like myself, you will arrive at the homeland of spirits and exclaim, Death is life. So, Monsieur Cousteau is really celebrating his transition and he is Hailing to Spiritism. And since we are studying, practicing Spiritism, some of us call themselves Spiritists, we hear from Signor, um, Monsieur Couston <clears throat> that we're on the right path. He is really in support of Spiritism as the new science helping us to understand. Then he says, the Spirit's book awakened within my soul the bonds of love for my creator. So that's a strong statement as well. So it was the Spirit's book that it awakened uh, Monsieur's, Monsieur Couston's soul and the, to the bonds of the bonds of love for his creator, for our creator. So within my soul, the book awakened within my soul, the bonds of love for my creator. So it was the Spirit's book that opened Cousteau's heart to God. And that is the invitation for us as well, to use the Spirit's book to open our heart to God. And even, I mean, all parts of the Spirit's book are magnificent. And yet the third part touches our heart in particular, the third part, which is 
the which are God's laws. I just want to pick up the Spirit's book for a moment and go to the last page, actually to the outside last page. And I want to read to you, and I'm sure you've read it, but I just want to remind us, I haven't had, I hadn't looked at it in a long time because I tend to open the book, but no, not look at its cover much. So here uh, in the summary, it says, after you have read the Spirit's book, you will no longer have any reason to fear death. Interesting, friends, right? And this is our theme. We're gathering to learn how to help our transition, how to work on our inner transformation, to prepare ourselves, how to prepare ourselves for eternal life. And here it says that the Spirit's book will help us to no longer have any reason to fear death. The Spirit's book will provide you with the answers to nearly all the questions you may have with regards to the origin, nature, and destiny of each and every soul on earth, and those of other worlds as well. It also addresses the issues of God, creation, moral laws, and the nature of spirits and their relationship with humans. The book contains answers that were dictated to mediums by highly evolved spirits who love God. You see, Cousteau felt the teachings in his heart. By reading, studying the Spirit's book, his heart opened to God. And here it says that the answers were all dictated by highly evolved spirits who love God. So Cousteau and we Kustur invites us to feel the love that comes through the Spirit's book via the Spirit's on high. Isn't it beautiful? That is our invitation to really open our hearts to the teachings. And how can we best open our hearts to the teachings, friends? It is by asking ourselves, where am I in this or that question? How am I doing with pride and selfishness? And I invite you to ask yourselves during the course of the next week, where am I? Am I where am I still prideful? Where am I still selfish? Where do I need work? Maybe we can make a renewed effort and remind ourselves to remember to do the nightly review that St. Augustine so lovingly helped us to understand the importance of because it's through the nightly review that we will be able to reflect back and hopefully find some dark spots where we would need to put the flashlight on and say, oh, there's another cobweb. I think that's called pride and I need to work on that. And that is how we open our hearts to God. This is by practicing, by practicing the good news, by practicing the teachings. So I think there was something else. Um, let me see. I have a note here. Um, yes. And then he says, Thank you, my good friends, for having brought me into your group. Please tell our brothers that I'm often with our friend Sanson. And again, friend Sanson was the first case we talked about several weeks ago in the second part of um, Heaven and Hell. And for those of you who weren't here or maybe don't remember what the core teachings that Mr. Sanson brought to us were, he said, our happiness is only a fiction here on this planet Earth. What we think is happy is really just fictional. It's not true happiness. Live wisely, he says, live virtuously, live charitably and love and you will be prepared. That is what Sanson taught us. And he also said one more very important thing. We cannot enjoy a lot of things without depriving others of their well-being, thereby morally committing a great evil. So by taking too much for us, which is again pride and selfishness, we are depriving others of their things. And if we want to work on selfishness and pride, we can avoid that, that he's asking us to avoid by using and applying the golden rule. Because that way we make sure we don't take too much for ourselves. Right, friends? So, 
I am with gratitude just um, wanting to um, ask you if you can to close your eyes for a moment for the closing prayer. Um, if you're driving, of course, please don't close your eyes. And let us connect again with God, the good spirits, Jesus, our guide and model. Helen Kardec with gratitude for his work he's done. Emmanuel, St. Augustine, all the spirit doctors, our personal mentors, we are so humbly humbled by your graciousness and magnitude of the teachings that we receive through spiritism, through the spirits on high. Thanks to the phalange of spirits who are continuously by our side, helping us to understand God's laws, helping us to open our hearts to feel the lessons, to practice the good, to feel the good, to visualize the good, and to mold the good with all the resources we have. And we're asking you humbly to remind us during the course of the week to practice the golden rule, for us to observe the level of pride and selfishness that may still reside in our hearts. And we're asking for help to release it and become more charitable, more benevolent, more forgiving, more indulgent. And with this and incredible gratitude to Kardec Radio and all the good spirits, we're asking humbly for permission to close our study session for tonight. And so be it. Dear friends, thank you so much for joining. We're wishing you a beautiful week. And till next week, so God willing, we will meet and talk about another good, happy spirit next time. Good night.